Welcome to Sunday, everyone. We are so stoked to have you for church today. And we've got some great things in store. Yes, and before we kick off, I just wanted to share a thought about um, during these COVID times, how there's so much focus on things that we can't do, that we used to be able to do, and all the changes. And actually how it's... um, it would be cool if we all had a bit of a shift in our thinking and actually focus on the things that we can do, uh, which at the moment could be loving your neighbour or um, sharing God's love to those around us. There's so many people who are lonely, um, lots of people struggling, and I think as Christians it's a really cool chance for us to actually be active in our faith and not just be waiting for church to come back how we used to know it, but to be stepping up and actually living out our faith um, on a daily basis. So we've got a great word from Pastor Colin, um, but we're going to head into some worship now. So tune in um, and make the most of this time for us to go to worship our God. Well, good morning, church at home. I'm so excited to worship together. Come on, stand with us and let's worship. How raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I'll raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me and I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar out from the ashes hope will
beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is to sing. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. nothing more beautiful than his name death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you to worship God in this place. We love you, Lord. Come on, we sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, 
your mercy never fails me all my days i've been held in your hand from the moment that i wake up until i lay my head i will sing of the goodness of god come on we sing say Good morning, Causeway Church. Welcome to Church Online, week 10 million. And um, I'm excited to be with you today and just to bring you God's word. And I believe it's a word in season. And so thank you for joining us wherever you are, whether you're in, gathered in homes around uh, in Level 2 community with small groups and watching wherever you are through New Zealand or many friends joining us in Australia and America and Alaska and around the world. It's pretty crazy. But anyway, what a it's, it's, uh, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Jeff uh, Lee 
from Life Church in Brisbane for bringing the word to us last week. And I love the fact that he just says, focus on Jesus. You can go back and watch that word. And we connect, Anne and I connect with Pastor Jeff and pastors on the, um, in Queensland and New South Wales every week on a Zoom call just for 30 minutes. Just to encourage, they've, they've been through some challenging times, we've got some challenging times, and it is unusual times. But I want to encourage you, God hasn't changed, He's still working, the church hasn't closed its doors, uh, God's got a plan and a purpose for Causeway Church, and that hasn't changed, our vision, our vision doesn't change, uh, we're, here, we're here to help people know God, we're here to help people discover, uh, find freedom, uh, settle their yesterdays, discover their purpose, and then take their life that God intended to make a difference. And we've got a new home to build for our church, even in this challenging time. And I want to say an incredible humbling thank you to Glow Church on the Gold Coast in uh, Australia. Pastor Joel and Alan Cave, I actually don't know them. I've never met them, but they've just uh, sown amazingly, uh, a gener very generously into our church build. And it just encourages me to tell us that God's got it. Well, some of you who know me well know I'm a petrol head. Uh, I love uh, V8s. I love fast cars. I love car racing. I love Formula One. I love V8 supercars. And one thing I do is often I, I've been to, I think, to Melbourne about five times to watch uh, the Formula One and then across to New South Wales to uh, flew into Sydney and then up to Bathurst to watch Bathurst. And I'm so excited. Bathurst comes, I think it's happening at the end of this month, early December. It's an amazing track, an amazing race. But anyway, one of the times I was in uh, in uh, Melbourne, a friend of mine who lived locally, actually his daughter was in one of the buildings and the cameras were on the building filming part of the Formula One track at Albert Park. And w while I was there, there was a lady I met and she was part of the design team for the new VE Commodore, which is an old car now. In fact, they don't make it anymore. We'll have a little teary moment there. And she was on the crash team. In other words, the, the factory would send her brand new cars to her team and they would crash them. And they would crash them from the front, from the sideways, from the back, uh, roll them over. And, and part of her, their, their, their reason for doing that is to design the car. To, to, they want to achieve a five-star safety rating. And they want, in the event of an accident, they want you to be protected as much as possible. So the car folds in certain places to protect the, the driver and the passengers in the car. And I think in this season we're in, I, I love this psalm. I, I, I shared a little bit about it. It's a special psalm to a family in our church. Uh, psalm 92 verse 12, but the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Don't miss that. But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. And this prompted me to do a little bit of a study on palm trees. Not quite where we're going to pitch in the passage today, but we'll get there. And palm trees have been designed by the Creator with the wind in mind. And what I love about palm trees, and I've been watching footage of palm trees in Category 5 hurricanes and this incredible ability to bend but not break. And I think God uses this picture to describe the believers that he wants to grow right from the get-go and certainly in this season that we're in now in New Zealand. This, the wind is starting to blow and it's gaining pressure. And we, we're going to start to see the results of employment mandates next week. Uh, we, we're looking like a new traffic system that uh, is coming in and we're going to have to learn to work with that and live with that. And, and work through that and at some time in life everyone will go through difficult times a challenging time or a time of testing and knew and God knew that life would t we would in life we would take hits he knew there was going to be some crashes he knew there was going to be some winds however like the palm tree and the cedars of Lebanon God never intends his creation he, he intends his creation to bend but not break he intended for his creation to bend like the palm tree, but not break. And God has created his most precious creation, that's you and me, with the capacity to bend, but not break. Your creator designed you to withstand the storm. And there are key tools we need to put in place to withstand 
the storm. And I, I don't know the speed of the wind that's blowing on you right now. I don't know the direction that it's coming from. But I know our nation, for our nation New Zealand, the storm has arrived. And sadly, there's massive division. But his church needs to rise above that. And there's, uh, there's going to be some bending, yes, but we don't need to break. And so we just call this message Unbreakable Faith. Unbreakable Faith. Anne and I and our family have had the privilege uh, many years ago to use a, a 34 yacht, a 34 foot keeler. And we did a lot of sailing and we had a lot of holidays in the Bay of Islands. And I, I didn't know too much about sailing. And so I went and did a, um, a, a course with Coast Guard, uh, Boatmaster course, learning how to read charts and signs and so that I was better equipped to do the sailing. And, and why do you need charts and signs and maps is so that when, so you can keep out of trouble or so when something goes wrong, you know how to respond to that. Well, this pandemic is a wind that's putting pressure on right now. And we're all experiencing the pressure. We're experiencing the pressure in husbands and wives and families and community, uh, certainly business and staffing issues, and it's made its way into the church. And so here's the question. Are you bending in the pressure? Are you bending in the pressure or is the pressure causing you to break? The level of fear out there right now is just staggering. And uh, I, I don't think Anne and I have watched the news for probably three or four months. There's a lot better fishing programs to watch. And uh, we, need, we need, like in the wind, um, when you're sailing, the, the boat has this big keel underneath it. And when you're sailing, you see the, you see the ripples coming across the water. And, the, the, and then the wind hits, the gust of wind hits the yacht. It knocks the, the boat down. In fact, you know, we had water coming into the cockpit. We've had water on the, on the windows right over the boat. But you know that keel, the, 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 the keel's going to, when the wind gust is finished, the keel's going to bring the boat up. And in this particular boat, it would always just round up into the wind, come up right, you gather yourself, and off you go again. And I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, we need a well-attached keel. Uh, and we need God's wisdom in this season. And God has a word exactly for you at the right time, and I think that's this morning. Some of you must, this morning, I know, just through this week of meeting people, some of you are at breaking point. Some of you may not have a job after Tuesday. And uh, a, a really a favorite pastor I love is called Frank Damasio. Uh, Frank Damasio was speaking at the Hillsong Conference in Sydney when Anne and I were there, and we kind of had a, an amazing God encounter. And he's just done a survey of all the, the pastors in his network and 75% of his pastors in his network had considering had considered resigning or quitting this in this this last year, 75%. And um, and so I want to go back to the the palm tree. The palm tree is an amazing example. It can stand strong. It bends in a Category Five hurricane from any direction. It it, it allows the tree to bend, but not break. And I've been studying palm trees and there's, there's conditions. One is the importance of the soil structure. What, what are your roots bedded into? And then the, the location of the tree. Where's it located and what's in its, where's it, what other trees is it planted with? So we're going to look at a, a really interesting passage this morning in Matthew chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, I love this passage. This is a fascinating passage and it's about the faith we need in this season and somebody needs to hear this message today right now it uh and so how does my life right now how does your life now reflect a palm tree your life has been designed to bend but not break it can take the hits but not get hurt you know the, the car's designed to bend but it's designed to protect the people in it so we're in a season where the enemy wants to break you by breaking the things that keep you standing strong. Your root system, your, your, the, the keel that's attached. So the way you keep yourself together is by protecting what's in the ground, the root system. It's not the palm tree that keeps the palm tree upright. It's the strong, healthy root system. So in the middle of the pressure that comes from the wind, it's what you don't see that stops the tree breaking. And it's exactly the same with faith. I think it's the faith, the faith that's underground, the roots that are underground. 
and uh, hopefully there's a picture of the foundations for the Auckland Sky Tower in New Zealand. There's a whole lot of that Sky Tower you don't see, but it's the, it's the roots, it's the, it's the structure in the ground that keeps that Sky Tower up. And all the services and what makes that building function uh, all go into the ground and come up. And I think it's a great analogy uh, for us as believers. The building stays standing because of what you don't see, its foundations. And so we must keep our foundations, our roots established in the things that are going to hold us together. So if I'm going to live an unbreakable life, I must develop an unbreakable faith. If I'm going to live an unbreakable life, I must develop and grow an unbreakable faith. A faith that can bend in the wind, but not break. I'm, I'm going to a, a, a attribute this quote to John Maxwell. I think well, it came out of him. I'm not sure if it's him, but he, he can claim it. A faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. A faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. And this season is going to test us as followers of Jesus, and it's going to test the church to see what we're made of. And right now there's an incredible sifting going on. A sifting going on. I often use this illustration of two chocolate bars. In New Zealand, we have two chocolate bars. One's called a flake and one called a pixie caramel. And if the flakes, if you just crush it, it just crumbles all and, and collapses. But the pixie caramel, the longer lasting chew, you've got to, you've, got, you've got to take time with it. It's like the keel that brings the yacht back up. And we don't know how good our root system is until it's put under pressure. We don't know how good our relationships are. We don't know how good our marriages are until they're put under pressure. Important we develop a resilient faith, and when the hit comes and um, the wind comes, we still believe our faith is strong. Because fragile faith breaks when the wind blows. So let's turn to this passage. Uh, you might think this is a bit left field, but I'm a bit left field. The lady in this passage is in a Category 5 hurricane. The wind is blowing hard on this lady's life. But I love this. She bends, but she doesn't break. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A gentlewoman who lived there came to him, pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She's bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was only sent to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him. Key point right there. Pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus. Jesus responded, it isn't, it, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. And she came straight back. That's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the crumb, the scraps that fall beneath the master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was he instantly Heal. There's the miracle. And God is still in the miracle business today, church. There's an interesting life principle in that first verse. It says Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. The reason Jesus left Galilee, if you want to go back and read the part, the passage before, is that the religious leaders and the Pharisees, that they just wanted to argue and debate and waste his time. And sometimes we have to leave one situation to walk to a new one. We need to be wise and steward our time. Don't waste time in stupid arguments. Just get on with the business. So Jesus goes to a different place and this Gentile woman, a non-Jew, comes to her, up to him and starts pleading with him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments, torments her severely. I think the wind is blowing severely in this lady's, lady's life. And this woman comes to Jesus and says, can you help? And I think we're going to see a powerful picture of unbreakable faith. Because in verse 23, but Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Hang on a minute. 
Isn't this Jesus, the, the ultimate expression of love? Isn't this the Jesus who wept when Lazarus died? Isn't this the Jesus that fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread? Isn't this the same Jesus that comes to the defense of a woman who's caught in adultery and is about to be stoned to death in John 8? And, and along comes a woman whose daughter is suffering and she asks for help and Jesus says nothing. Literally squat. Now, breakable faith would probably be offended at this point and walk. Breakable faith leaves when God didn't come through. But unbreakable faith survives the silence. Unbreakable faith survives the silence. And this lady says, Jesus, I'm not going anywhere until you give me an answer. And if we're going to live an unbreakable life, we have to be able to bend through the season when as individuals, when as, as families, when as communities, we come under incredible pressure. It feels like we're under the pressure of the wind and it can feel sometimes like God is silent. And there's a couple of other places where God, in fact, there's a whole lot of other places where God appeared to be silent. I'm just going to highlight a couple. One of them's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and the Apostle Paul. And he's dealing with what we believe is an unidentified issue. He calls it a thorn in the flesh. And three times he asks, three times he sought the Lord to remove it. First time, silence. Second time, silence. And breakable faith would walk at this point. I quit. I'm over this. I'll find something else to do. And the third time God says, my grace, Paul, is sufficient for you. Paul's faith bent in the wind, but it didn't break. School, it's particularly uh, school wasn't really my most favorite place, particularly college. But I do remember one thing is that sometimes you'd go into these big halls to sit major exams and the desks are all lined up and the, the papers are on the desks all turned over and you have to sit at your seat. And one thing that in, in the test, the teacher never says a word. You, you've, you've expected to have learnt the test and now you're going to sit the test. You can't put your hand up and say, hey teacher, can you help me with question three? Why? The teacher remains silent in the test. And I think sometimes that's what we've got to look th uh, through this in this season. And there's another time where God was silent. A precious chapter in Daniel chapter three uh, and, and involves three Hebrew boys. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had gone into Jerusalem just to frame this quickly. Uh, go and read the whole chapter. It's, it's the whole book of Daniel is fantastic. Uh, um, he, he, kept, he, he selects captives. He takes them back to Babylon. He renames these boys. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He, he, he renames them, from, takes their Hebrew names off them. And this is the passage in uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves. So just go back, sorry. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's built an idol, and when the when the when the Rolling Stones start playing, everybody has to be, bow down and worship the idol, right? So these three Hebrew boys say, "You can get stuffed, Nebuchadnezzar. We're not going to do it." Okay, so the punishment for that is to be thrown into a, a furnace and burnt to death, cremated, call it what you like. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace. The God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. And here it is. But even if he doesn't, the text tells me God hadn't given them an answer. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, Nebuchadnezzar, your majesty, showing honor to authority, that we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. They didn't. They didn't put any conditions on the situation. This could have been deliverance or this could have been death. And the boy says, we could bow down to your stupid idol and be comfortable, but we're not committed to comfortable. We're committed to God. And I think in this season, church, we don't have, we're not going to be committed to comfortable. We're going to be committed to God. And I've learned this in my life. When I, when I think God is silent, it doesn't mean God isn't answering. When I think God is silent, it doesn't mean God isn't answering. These three men, when the temperature went up and the wind started to blow, 
blow hot. Uh, God was right there with them. And we don't know theology-wise whether it was an angel or actually this was a, a, a pre-shot of Jesus in the furnace with them. But it's an amazing story where they just said, doesn't matter, we'll, we'll go either way. So back to the lady with Jesus. Jesus is silent, but she keeps talking and the disciples say to Jesus, tell her to get lost. Verse 23, when his disciples urged him to send her away, tell her to go away, they said, she is bothering us with all her begging. First thing, they were not in her shoes. They didn't have a suffering child. They didn't have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. If as followers of Jesus, we become insensitive to the suffering of other people because it doesn't maybe directly affect us, then I think it's a really important time to take a look at ourselves, have a look in the mirror and question our faith. Jesus has a lot of work to do on those disciples to knock them into shape. So think about this lady. Jesus is silent. The disciples can't be bothered. And some days those palm trees just have to face hurricanes and they bend, but they don't break. Then Jesus finally does speak to her and listen to what he says. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to the lost, uh, to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. That wasn't what she was hoping to hear. She's Gentile. And Jesus' ministry priority right at that point was to the Jew first. The ministry to the Gentiles would come after Pentecost and that would come through Peter. So breakable faith would have been offended at this point and walked. Unbreakable faith survives offense. That's really, really important. Unbreakable faith survives offense. And Jesus' comments could be interpreted as rude or offensive. She could have taken offense and left right then and missed the miracle. But this woman had unbreakable faith. And uh, have you ever been offended with God? Yep. I was sharing at my small group, just a, a season in Anne and I, our lives, where I was angry with God, I was upset with God, I even swore at God. And I tell you what, unbreakable faith survives offense. Unbreakable faith survives offense. Jesus said this in Matthew, go and read the whole passage, Matthew 11, verse 6. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. I'm thinking we, 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 we have to hold things loosely. We have to get over offense. Why? Because on the other side of offense is the favor of God and the blessing of God. Paul could have been offended when he didn't get his answer. The Hebrew boys couldn't have been offended when they could have been offended when King Nebuchadnezzar put them in the furnace. After Jesus first silent and then kind of implied he wouldn't help her because she wasn't Jewish. Look what happens. Verse 25, then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. That's a powerful, powerful thing to do when the tree's bending, when you're in the middle of a Cat 5 hurricane. In the storm, the palm tree's bending. Listen, the pos the, I see her in the posture of worship. I actually see her on her knees, possibly even face down. She chooses to worship after the silence, she chooses to worship after the disciples wanted her gone. She chooses to worship when all that was offered was breadcrumbs. And if you want to know if there's a type of worship that moves the heart of God, it's people who choose to worship in the storm. It's people who choose to worship in the storm. It's people who choose to worship when you think God's silent. It's people who choose to worship in the pain. And it's people who choose to worship in the loss. But Jesus, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. See, unbreakable faith isn't tied to your goodness. It's tied to the goodness of God. Unbreakable faith isn't tied to your goodness. Your goodness, it's tied to the goodness of God. And then Jesus answered her and said to the woman, I love this. I get so excited about this. Oh woman, great is your faith. How would you love Jesus to say that about you? Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. I think in the New Testament, there's only one other place in the whole Bible that uses the term great faith we have an enemy who you who knows if he can break your faith he can break and break your trust in you in god he can break your life 
The way you keep yourself together is keeping your faith together. Unbreakable faith simply chooses to trust God, to trust God, no matter what. Trust God in the storm. Uh, some of you are under immense pressure right now. Uh, relationships, jobs, finances, so much division. Be very intentional about developing your faith. The wind blows and you bend, but you don't need to break. God made you like the palm tree. And I'm, I'm praying right now that God will give you the grace to be bendable, but not breakable. And as, as the wind blows in one direction, I'm playing, and one of the terms of the Holy Spirit is actually a wind, and that's a good wind. I'm praying the, whole, the wind of the Holy Spirit is going to blow in the other direction, and you will stand tall and straight like those cedars of Lebanon. In other words, church, the wind is going to blow. And the wind may bend us, but we will be strong because our roots are down deep. That keel to that yacht is well attached. And can I encourage you with this? One day the wind is going to stop and the weather will settle. But in the meantime, there are four things that I hold that hold me together. Four foundations that I just hold on to and build on. One is God's word. Truly be in it daily. Make sure you've got a reading plan or a devotional, something, some structure. It's important to have structures and routines, God's word daily. Worship. You are created to worship. It does something to your soul. It restores your soul. It brings a presence and a peace. In the middle of tension and conflict, I just say, go and put on praise and worship music. Or if for you, worship can be walking the beach. Or sometimes it can be in the bush, just walking in the bush. At the moment, the Tui's in our, we've got a carry tree just by our house, and about five, quarter past five in the morning, or quarter, yeah, about quarter past five, the Tui's start to wake up with their morning song, and I just imagine them worshipping the Creator. The other thing that I do is, is we've got to pray. Anne and I are praying right now. We pray for our church. We pray that our church is protected. We pray for provision. We pray for wisdom. We pray for supernatural downloads for your people. And I, we tell, I tell God how I'm feeling. And one thing I've learned, prayer shakes the gates of hell. If, if, if God can rob you, uh, sorry, if Satan can rob you of praying, he's, he's, he, he gives that a big tick because praying shakes the gates of hell. And the fourth thing that I think is really important, and I don't think in this season, no matter what happens, I don't think we want to lock ourselves away. We, we need community. We were created for a relationship with God and we're created with others and we need community. So those are the four things I put down, I, I, I do. I just stay in God's word, worship, prayer and community. And uh, that's how I put my roots down when the wind blows. And that allows me to bend but not break. So in this season, let's expect to see the supernatural of God, just like the woman in our, in our passage this morning. Let's fight against fear. The future does not belong to the enemy. The future does not belong to the enemy. It belongs to you and God. Psalm 92, 12. But the godly will flourish like the palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. It's just a privilege and an honor to, to bring the word to you today. I just want, I want to um, maybe just encourage anyone who's joining us you may not be part of our church community you may not know jesus christ as your lord and savior i really encourage you to contact us i want to just just pray for you now and uh, it's a very simple prayer where we just invite jesus to come into our hearts and his holy spirit comes in right there when we take that step of faith we come and ask him to come and be our lord and savior we want to say sorry for our sin we want to repent for the past and, and I'm just so excited we can start this new life, this clean slate, this fresh start with God. So, Father, I just pray for everyone watching right now, whether they've known you for a long time or they don't know you at all, that I pray right now your Holy Spirit will just touch them. I pray not the wind of the turmoil of, of our nation, but actually there will be a gentle wind of the Holy Spirit. Just blow on them right now. Just touch them right now. In Jesus' name, let them know how much God loves them. Let them know that he allowed his son to die on a cross for them. Greater love has no man than to lay down their life for another. That's how much God loves you. Amen. Please get in touch with us. 
God bless you. See you next time.